Thank you very much. And thank you, Bank, for inviting me to participate in this wonderful week. Well, as Professor Nordain has just implied, there's some bad news, but there's also some good news. Uh, the the uh, bad news is that I've got a lot of equations to show you, <laughs> mathematical equations. But the good news is that the examination's been cancelled. <laughs> well, nuclear magnetic resonance is perhaps the most important form of spectroscopy in chemistry and in biochemistry. It came into being in the 1950s and has gone from strength to strength. It is capable of looking at high resolution at the solution phase, liquid phase, also at solids and gases even, but its ability to work in the solution phase is, is perhaps its most important aspect in chemistry. The molecules are tumbling freely, isotropically, and we get high resolution spectra which give us information about the structure and the properties of molecules. But, although it's our most important form of spectroscopy, it is said to be blind to chirality. Well, chirality is handedness. We had a splendid and delightful lecture on chirality earlier this week. Uh, an object is said to be chiral, like a left hand, if it is distinguishable from its mirror image, the right hand. If it's indistinguishable from its mirror image, it's said to be achiral. Well, nuclear magnetic resonance, as I hope to show you... What have, what have I done with the pointer? Where is it for? No. Oh, there it is. Th thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to show you. You're going to spend a, a few minutes on symmetry operators. Symmetry operators because that'll help us understand what is needed for the study of chiral molecules. Other forms of spectroscopy, uh, electronic spectroscopy, ultra, uh, vibrational spectroscopy in the infrared, Raman spectroscopy in the visible or other regions, give us dis can distinguish a left-handed molecule from a right-handed molecule. Nuclear magnetic resonance doesn't do that. Now, how, does, how do those spectroscopies make a distinction? Well, uh, they have to I'm, going to... I'm going to illustrate it briefly through optical rotation, which is the traditional way of looking at chiral systems. And in fact, it was very influential in the development of your career, Bengt, where he has studied circular dichroism and utilized it very extensively in biochemistry. Well, so circular dichroism is a dis difference in absorptivity of left and right circularly polarized light. Well, let me try and make clear to you what circularly polarized light is. So imagine a light beam traveling towards you, circularly, uh, linearly polarized for a start. So the electric vector of the light is vertical. It's traveling towards you, and if it is right circularly polarized, it will be rotating like this as you see it. That electric vector. In other words, it'll be rotating from your point of view in a clockwise sense. 
uh, left circularly polarized light is rotating in the opposite sense, the electric vector. Well, and linearly polarized light can be thought of as an equal mixture of left and right. If we go to a quantum description, rather surprisingly, a right circularly polarized photon, the one which you see is going like that, actually has an angular momentum of minus one. And the reason for that is that historically, the right and left was seen from the point of view of the observer, you in this case. Whereas now we tend to think of angular momentum as the angular momentum of the object itself, the photon. Light can be thought of as an electromagnetic wave, <clears throat> as we normally do, but it also can be thought of as a beam of photons. Photons, unlike the electrons that Prof Professor Zewell told us so beautifully about this morning, are uncharged. Electrons are charged, so they don't like to be close to each other. Photons, on the other hand, like to be close to each other. And uh, that's, that property is exploited in, in lasers. So there are d important differences between electron beams and light beams. Now, coming back to our linearly polarized light, here's our electric vector. How is it going to rotate the plane of that polarization as it is transmitted through a solution? Well, the oscillating electric field pushes and pulls electrons in that direction, and that, source of, that is a source of radiation, and that propagates the beam. It causes the refractive index, that oscillating charge, or induced dipole, as we commonly describe it. How are we going to rotate it? Well, we need to have a dipole in the perpendicular direction. But the electromagnetic field is, contains an electric field here, and there'll be a magnetic field in the horizontal direction. So how can that magnetic field induce an oscillating dipole, which will interact with this one to rotate the plane of polarization? Well, consider a helix. We've heard of helixes many times this morning already. So fundamental in uh, molecular biology. And so here we have a helix, and now we have a magnetic field in this direction. What does the magnetic field do to electrons? Well, it induces a current. It tends to give them a twist. So here's our magnetic field. It's tending to twist the electrons, and if it's a helix or a screw, what happens if you twist electrons on a on a helix, well, it'll go forward or back. It'll go forward if it's right-handed, it'll go back if it's left-handed. So the extra oscillating dipole coming from the magnetic interaction will have opposite signs for a right and a left-handed molecule. So that's the origin of optical rotation, which is, has been so important in circular dichroism studies. They're now, circular dichroism studies are now being carried out extensively in the infrared region. There's an advantage in that, as well as a disadvantage. The disadvantage is it's a slightly more difficult range to work with in uh, in some respects, detection and uh, production. Uh, so, but the advantage of the infrared is that you have many modes of vibration. If a molecule has n nuclei, there are three n minus six degrees of vibrational freedom. And that means we can look at, and each one will have its unique frequency. So we have, in principle, a large number of vibrational modes, each of which will be probing the handedness of that molecule. So 
Vibrational circular dichroism is now an important means of studying chiral systems. So also is Raman optical activity, which I'm pleased to be able to say was found in our laboratory in 1971. The first experiments were done by uh, Lawrence Barron in my group and uh, Martin Bogart. And that means you sub subject the molecule or the liquid or system to left or right circularly polarized incident light. And you look at the different intensities of the Raman scattered light in left and right circularly polarized incident light. And that has considerable advantages over vibrational circular dichroism because it's uh, working in the visible region or in the, in the ultraviolet region rather than the infrared. And it also is capable of studying proteins in aqueous solution. The water is a very weak scatterer of optical fields, optical waves, so that the Raman intensity from the liquid water is negligible, whereas in the infrared it can be dominant. Well, so much for optical spectroscopy. NMR is blind to chirality, as we, I said earlier. Perhaps the reason for that can be understood through these two operators, P and T. And the operator P, called the parity operator, inverts the coordinates of all particles in the molecule, nuclei and electrons, through the origin. So R becomes minus R, where R is the vector describing the position of the molecule relative to the origin. Time reversal T reverses the motion of all the particles. So velocity V is changed to minus V. And now we can ask, is a property even under P, is it unchanged by parity and time reversal, or is the property reversed? These are the two possibilities. Some properties are unchanged both by both P and T. For example, the mass of the object is unchanged. So is its energy. So is its polarizability and its magnetizability. The magnetizability describes the magnetic moment induced by a magnetic field. Properties that are even under the time reversal operator but odd under parity, for example, the electric dipole moment mu, or the first hyperpolarizability beta. The first hyperpolarizability describes the dipole quadratic in an applied field, or indeed the product of two fields, E1 and E2. So it gives frequency doubling or some frequency generation in nonlinear optics. Now, these properties that are even under T and not under P can only exist if a molecule lacks a center of symmetry, center of inversion. Properties that are even under par parity P and odd under the time reversal operator T, for example, the magnetic moment M, and the anti-symmetric polarizability alpha prime. Alpha prime is a slightly esoteric property. It depends on <clears throat> the molecule having uh, be, not being symmetric under T, so it has to be equal and opposite for a system with positive angular momentum and one with negative angular momentum. Uh, but it's responsible for, for example, the Faraday effect in magneto-optics. I'll come to that later if there's time. Uh, so such molecules can only with odd under T, can only exist if the system possesses a sense of time. And that sense of time can be given through an intrinsic angular momentum, say a hydrogen atom with a spin of plus a half, or a hydrogen atom with a spin of minus a half. But if the system doesn't have a spin, 
then it would be symmetric under time reversal, unless there is an imposed sense of time through an applied magnetic field. The magnetic field, as I said a moment ago, induces a current density in the molecule. The electrons are brought into motion by that magnetic field, and that, of course, imposes a sense of time. So, uh, now let's ask what a chiral molecule is. What is a chiral molecule? They possess what are known as pseudoscalar properties. A pseudoscalar property is one that is isotropic, doesn't matter how we oriented it in space, its value doesn't change, but its value is reversed if we go from a right-handed description, X, Y, Z, or Z, as you say in North America. Uh, as you go, that's a left-handed frame, here's a right-handed frame. If you go from X, Y, Z to minus X, minus Y, minus C, then if that property changes, uh, changes sign according to the handedness of the frame, then it is a pseudoscalar. And chiral molecules have pseudoscalar properties. The best known example of that is the optical rotational strength, which is a product of a transition electric dipole. In dichroism, we're looking at transitions from one quantum state, zero, the ground state, to an excited state, P. So that's the transition electric dipole, which determines the intensity of the transition. And here's the transition magnetic dipole. So that's odd under time reversal. That's even. But the imaginariness of it also changes time. So that's even under time reversal and odd under parity. So it characterize, it's, it's, a, it's very much a pseudoscalar property. Another example of a pseudoscalar property, a little bit more uh, exotic, but nevertheless, uh, it's, been, it's been recorded, is this component, this isotropic component of the hyperpolarizability beta, giving the nonlinear response to applied electric fields, nonlinear dipole induced by two electric fields. And they need to be different fields in this case. Here we, I was talking about frequency doubling, where the beta, uh, this beta here, the first hyperpolarizability. The first polarizability is just alpha, which gives the dipole linear in the applied field. If that field is strong, or if there are two fields, E1 and E2, then they together can have an interaction with the system, giving us an induced dipole, and that uh, gives scattered light, radi it radiates at the frequency of the oscillating dipole, and so we can generate a sum frequency from two applied fields, E1 and E2, and, here, and that is the, whoops, uh, the, that uh, is a pseudoscalar property and therefore a chiral property. So even an isotropic chiral solution, sugar solution for example, is capable of this nonlinear optical property. Uh, and it has been observed and uh, is, is an interesting chiral property of molecules. Now, coming back to NMR. The Hamiltonian, which describes the allowed energy states of a system, is shown there. And it consists of the nuclear magnetic moment uh, of molecule of nucleus N. This is, a, this is the Kronecker delta, so that's one or zero. This is the chemical shift or the nuclear screening tensor and beta, B is the applied magnetic field. So this gives the change, this will give us a change of energy, linear in the magnetic field, and the magnetic moment of the nuclear. That spits the energy levels of the nuclei. There's a second contribution, if there are, um, is more than one nuclear spin. 
the magnetic moments proportional to the nuclear spin of that nucleus, I n. And this is the spin-spin coupling. So the spin of nucleus n interacts with the spin of nucleus n prime, and we get a whole large number of lines through spin-spin interaction, giving us information about the structure and properties of the molecule. An interesting point is what about the direct coupling of the nuclear spins? Here are two nuclear nuclei with spins in our system. In a liquid, it's tumbling freely, and these two spins, remember they're held by the magnetic field. They have angular momentum in the direction of the field of plus a half or minus a half. And so as that molecule rotates, they retain their spins for lifetimes of the order of one second. Long, long time, nuclear spin lifetimes, except in certain other cases. But for normal spins of a half, these lifetimes are very long. That's why we have such high-resolution NMR spectra. Lifetimes are of the order of a second, so line widths are of the order of one hertz or less. Very important attribute. But if, the, if we go to the solid, then there is a problem because the molecule is no longer tumbling. So these nuclear interactions, the direct interactions, will not be zero. And so, in fact, their strength varies as the magnitude inverse cube of the separation. It's a dipole-dipole coupling. And that gives us a very, very broad spectrum in the solid, uh, which wouldn't have the same impact on chemistry where we have many fewer lines. So oddly enough, a fewer number of lines gives us a better, cleaner spectrum. And that's obtained by the isotropic tumbling of the molecules, which averages out the dipole-dipole coupling, except in cases where there is a favoured direction in the system. If we go to the isotropic liquid, which is the normal NMR situation, uh, Hamiltonian is simplified, and it is, this is called the chemical shift of nucleus N. For protons, it's of the order of a few parts in a million. For heavier nuclei, it can be bigger. For very heavy nuclei, it can be of the order of 1% or 2%. For example, for cobalt-59, uh, I think it's, it's of the order of 2%. Very large chemical shifts can be observed. Uh, for protons, it's just a, a part per million or so. So it gives, it, at 600 megahertz, that would still give us a very big shift. One part per million at 600 megahertz is, what is it, 60 hertz. It's a huge, and the resolution is... 0.1 of a hertz. So you can see the amount of information that's there in the spectrum. Now, here's the, this is the bad news for NMR. Sig the chemical shift and the spin coupling are even under parity and time reversal. So they're possessed by all molecules uh, where there are these nuclear spins but it's blind to chirality. It's the same for a molecule and its mirror image. Now, let's, let's look a little bit more closely at that chemical shift. Uh, it, can give us, it can give us the change in the magnetic field at nucleus N, delta B, resulting from the interaction of the electrons with the magnetic field. And it's transposed, and said, not, whoops, whoops. Uh, uh, it's transposed, gives us the magnetic moment of the molecule as a whole as it differs from that of the nucleus. In other words, this is the magnetic moment induced in the electronic environment of the nucleus. The nuclear spin exerts, interacts with the electrons and induces a current density in them which has a magnetic moment. So there's a change of magnetic moment, part per million uh, 
typically. Uh, and uh, so that is one way of looking at it. We have the, in fact, that's how we should look at it in Fourier transform NMR spectroscopy, which is the, the modern form. The, the nuclear magnetic, nuclear moments induce a magnetic moment in, in the molecule, and uh, the whole system is uh, brought into precession about the magnetic field, and different nuclear, different um, moments will process at slightly different frequencies, and that will be recorded in the spectrum. Now, so, but the, as I mentioned, the, this property is the same for a molecule in its mirror image. So there's no chirality there. What do we need for a chiral response? Well, let's, we want to find something odd under parity. So let's look at the electric dipole. Can a nuclear spin induce an electric dipole in the molecule? Delta mu. Well, let, let, it'll be a, here's a linear response with the magnetic moment, and here is a linear response to the time derivative of the magnetic moment. The, the magnetic moment is changing in time, uh, so will that, and it's changing in time typically at a radio frequency, the frequency of the spectrometer. Let's inquire what property, how these properties would behave under P and T. The chemical shift is even under both, so it's possessed by all molecules. The nuclear spin-spin coupling is even under both, so it's possessed by all of them. This property, xi n, giving us the dipole, odd under parity, which is good for chiral sensitivity, odd under time reversal, which is bad, except that the magnetic field lifts that time reversal symmetry. So this could have an effect because of the presence of the strong magnetic field. This time derivative here does in fact here, so, so, so you can think of it this way, the nuclei are rotating, processing at radio frequency, say 600 megahertz, and that, will that motion induce an electric, uh, electric dipole? Well, get, let's go back to our uh, helix. Remember how if we, the magnetic field gives a twist, which gives a translational moment. Similarly, if we, um, if we have a push-pull effect, uh, the, um, the magnetic moment is, is rotating. Time, there's a time derivative of M there, so the electrons are being pushed and pulled, and that gives us a dipole by that motion. So, that is a chiral effect there, and we'll, but unfortunately it tends to be rather small, and the, this one, perturbed by the magnetic field, turns out to be much stronger. So this is the effect that counts, whoops. The nuclear spin generates an electric dipole by virtue of the presence of the magnetic field. So it's a third rank tensor, like that hyperpolarizability. And it'll have an isotropic part, which will be a pseudoscalar. So there it is in the next line. There's this pseudoscalar, which means that uh, in NMR of chiral molecules, in addition to the magnetic moment induced by the nuclear spin, there's also an electric moment, which is equal and opposite for left and right-handed molecules. So the actual change of the electric dipole moment has these, this, uh, time to, this, this term here due to the time dependence of the magnetic moment. Turns out to be small. I won't say anything more about it. Uh, it's small at, at, radio, at the radio frequency we work with. It is, would not be small if we if the magnetic moment was changing at optical frequencies. Uh, so this is the term that is capable of de dealing with NMR. It's somewhat similar to the Faraday effect. I mentioned the Faraday effect briefly earlier. This is the anti-symmetric polarizability, which is odd under time reversal, 
So it only exists in molecules, uh, in diamagnetic molecules, in the presence of the magnetic field, and it, here it is in, in, uh, as a third rank tensor, and that will have an isotropic part, but it's even under P and T, so it's a property of all of matter, as Michael Faraday showed us in 1845, uh, that a magnetic field induces optical rotation in all matter, even under P and T. Doesn't need chirality. Well, how a point to notice is the fact that we've got to have this magnetic field to induce the time asymmetry reduces the magnitude of the effect. I call it a contamination of the state by the magnetic field. We have a state which is time symmetric. The magnetic field is applied, it induces a current, but it's the contamination of the state of the wave function is only a few parts in a thousand. Uh, in most cases. In some cases, of course, it would be much more. Now, there is another way of, of looking at it. Uh, that's the question. Whoops, that's the question. Uh, well, how big is this uh, pseudo-scalar qu quantity? Uh, and the, oh, I know, there is another. There is another point I should have made there. Um, here is the magnetic field at the nucleus, uh, and in, uh, the, this is the chemical shift. And here is the presence of an electric field in, in uh, uh, causing a magnetic field at the nucleus. And but that is more commonly written in this form, that the chemical shift is linearly dependent on the electric field. And this is called the shielding polarizability. The, sh the, po the shielding constant is perturbed by the magnetic field, by, big pardon, by an electric field, the electric field, and that turns out to be very important in interpreting chemical shifts. We can see in simple organic molecules how the addition of substituents can introduce an electric field at a nucleus. And that field could also be solvent dependent. And we know quite a lot about that electric field. And so we can interpret the chemical shifts of molecules through this shielding polarizability. And that goes right back to 1960, a paper in 1960, uh, where that property uh, was introduced. So we have this interesting identity that the chirally sensitive property giving us the oscillating magnetic, oscillating electric dipole in NMR spectroscopy is actually equivalent to the shielding polarizability. Uh, so this Third rank tensor, here it is, has an isotropic part, but it's pseudoscalar property. It has three meanings. It can either mean a change in the magnetic field of the nucleus, it can mean a change in the magnetic moment of the molecule uh, as a whole, or it can in mean a change in the electric dipole of the molecule. Here it is. Uh, and if an isotropic medium, it simplifies to vector products of the magnetic field and the electric field will induce a nuclear a, a magnetic field of the nucleus. The magnetization times the electric field will induce magnetic magnetization, uh, and finally the electric dipole uh, of the system is the, pro the vector product of the magnetization and of the magnetic field. Estimates, how big is this chirally sensitive property? Well, for protons, we can do simple calculations and we find it's of the order of a few parts per million for an atomic unit of field. An atomic unit of field is a very big unit of field. It's the field one bore from a proton, five by 10 to the 11 volts per meter. Uh, 
Here, this is for H00H, uh, hydrogen peroxide, which isn't normally thought of as a chiral molecule because of uh, inter uh, rotation. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, it tunnels through the barrier, but it, it is a molecule in its equilibrium state with the C2 symmetry, and so it is chiral, and as the dihedral angle changes, uh, so does the, so does the uh, chirality goes through zero for the planar, planar positions uh, and for zero and 180. Uh, or 360, rather, I beg your pardon, 360. Well, and 180, yes. Uh, how do we do the NMR spectrometer? How do we do the NMR experiment? Well, these days it's done through a Fourier transform experiment. The magnetization, whoops, I keep pressing the wrong one here. Uh, Oops. Uh, the, mag the magnetic field induces magnetization along the z-axis. The on the x-axis. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, the, the, so this is this induces a ninety-degree rotation of the magnetization from the z-axis into the xy plane, and then that magnetization processes around the magnetic field at the resonance frequency. So different nuclei will be processing at slightly different frequencies, and that's what we detect from the, the this is the transmitter, which gives the pi over two pulse, but it's also the receiver, and it receives the oscillating magnetization whose Fourier transform is the spectrum. That's how it works. Well, in order to detect a rotating electric polarization, we're going to need an electric capacitor. So imagine a capacitor on the y-axis, and the rotating magnetization uh, will, will be uh, processing around there at the resonance frequency, and if it's chiral, it will be inducing a an elec electric polarization on the capacitor. Turns out there's a much bigger contribution from orientation polarization in the case of dipolar molecules. If our molecule carries a permanent electric dipole, the presence of the magnet magnetic field uh, uh, and the nuclear magnetization orients the molecule linearly in those, those two phenomena. It's the... Uh, it, it, and so... It, it, and that effect for dipo simple dipolar molecules turns out to be about a thousand times bigger than the distortion that I was talking about before. So there are two contributions to the oscillating polarization. One from an orientation arising from the anti-symmetry of the nuclear magnetic shielding tensor. The fact that sigma xy is different from sigma yx. Uh, in, in most cases. In, and so that means how big, how big can we expect the effect to be then? Uh, this, here's the anti-symmetry in the nuclear shielding uh, tensor, and I've called it sigma star. So we get, there's the term I was talking about before, the distortion term giving an oscillating dipole induced by the nuclear spin in the presence of the magnetic field. B, but this is the temperature-dependent orientation term, and you see it depends on the anti-symmetry of the nuclear shielding. Anti-symmetry. XY is different from YX. So how big is the voltage you'd expect on a, on a simple capacitor? Well, it's of the order of a microvolt, uh, which is very hopeful indeed. But what about experiments? Well. I've retired for some years now, but I'm still collaborating with friends and colleagues. And in the French High Magnetic Fields Laboratory, uh, we are setting up an experiment. And the leader of the group is Gert Ricken. This is the French High Magnetic Fields Laboratory. The actual work's been going on in Grenoble. Pierre Fisher was a student of mine. Uh, 
who published the second paper in this field here with me. Stefan Kramer is in charge of NMR at the French High Magnetic Field Laboratory. Uh, Peter Garbash from Warsaw is the postdoc doing the work. Paolo Lazaretti in Italy is doing computations of the effect. And unfortunately, I don't have a result to report, but we're optimistic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm afraid we neither have time for questions or the ability to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think that David did a fantastic job because now you see that some things are sometimes a little difficult to grasp. Mm -hmm. This is the third time I go through this. This is my field, so I should understand it, but there are still a few things I need to have explained. We must get together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you. there could have been another way of uh, presenting this, which is one which you often see at school, when people try to explain something which they think is difficult to explain by just hand-waving. I hate that. It doesn't give you a feeling. At least your talk gave us a feeling for what it is about. And I think that is extremely important. So, I hope my confession that I still have some problems here tells you that you are not hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> and I congratulate David to being at the very research frontiers of something new that could become very important. Because these are the tools that we eventually have in our labs to do very important analysis. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. <laughs>